I didn't realize there was that much stuff on there, but that's okay. It is what it is. I appreciate the to be here and, and speak to this year's grazing conference. I think this is the third time I think I've served in different capacities. Uh, at 26 today, years of grazing data that was mentioned earlier. Uh, my dad was with me a couple, two, two or three years ago when we did it. And so somebody talked to me about addressing this topic, uh, turning woodland into pasture. Pretty good. Physics professor was, and it was a student in there that didn't really like the idea. And I see we have uh, some students in the group today. Welcome, good to have you. And I told Ronnie earlier. I said it must be a lot of young folks that want to be Daniel Boone and want to get in here and cut the tree. <laughs> about that, but he said, "Well, tough." And I can remember asking that question when I was a student. You know what? I have to responded to save lives. You need to well, up again. And seeing this class was required because this student, this was a pre-med student, and this class was required for the pre-med students. And he says, so how physics saves lives? And he said, it, the professor said, it keeps the ignorant out of med school. <laughs> Uh, we're going to move on here, if I can get this to go right, to turn it on. No, I didn't. Now I did. There we go. Things want to try to our farm country so you know where we came from and where we are today. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about is uh, a 14 acre, 14.4 acre area that we took from actual timber land and converted it to a 14.4 acre pasture field. That's what we're going to be talking about. And uh, then we've got some pictures, and then if we've got a little time at the end, we'll entertain some questions. Uh, we are, uh, along with my wife, we back here in the corner, and we're doing. Range. Uh, that's part of the Allegheny Mountain Plateau uh, in Barber County. We're actually the southern end of Barber County, joins uh, Randolph County. Uh, our ele the elevation for our farm is between 1,900 and 2,000 feet uh, as far as our, where we are there. Our soil complex is basically a gilpin upshur type of soil base. And it has pretty much, if you look at the soil survey, uh, we have an average yield uh, for what's in West Virginia. We do average about 48 inches of precipitation, and about 15 of that occurs in June, July, and August. And as we're about two miles from Beelington, uh, actually west of Beelington on the Audra Park Road. If you're ever in that area, stop by and see us. Uh, a little more of our history. Uh, about 200 acres of land was purchased at, by way of multiple tracts in 1952 by Rita Jean's parents, Doug and Rita Haney. And they moved to the farm in 56. Uh, they were part-time farm, part farmers like many of us uh, and did their farming with, while they were trying to maintain an off-the-farm job. Rita Jean and I got married in 75 and, and uh, after we graduated from WVU and started helping at the farm. And at that point, uh, the farm was overgrown with a lot of broom sedge, four rows, brush, and the fence lines and those kinds of things. And uh, Rita Jean's dad and I had several elbow sessions, I called it, at the kitchen table, uh, thinking about what we can do. And, and uh, even though I was a son-in-law, I always appreciated the fact that he called me son. And uh, I remember it wasn't too long after we were married, he said, now son, he said, you've been to school, you studied this plant science thing, and uh, I want to know how to get rid of this broom sedge. What's it going to take? And he wasn't worried about the multiple four rows at that time because Tordon was coming on the scene just a short time afterwards and he took care of that and a lot of other things. But uh, <laughs> sounds like some of you may have done that as well. But uh, 
one of them deals for a little bit of do a little bit of good, a lot of do a lot of good. And uh, so he killed some trees he didn't intend to kill. But, but anyway, uh, we had some of those sessions at the table, and, and I told him, I said, well, if you want to get rid of the broom sedge, you're going to need money, patience, lime and fertilizer, and some time. And uh, so we began to work on that, and, and uh, it is what it is today. But our to-do list uh, from those sessions did include uh, dealing with the soil fertility. Uh, he had never done any soil testing in his life, and so we started that. Looked at the fencing, uh, looked at the genetics of the cow herd at the time, and that certainly looked at developing all the water that we possibly could. We are blessed with lots of water, a lot of different sources of water. Uh, the herd was Angus-based, which Rita Jean and I did sell in 1998. We liquidated the herd and went into a contract grazing operation in 98. Um, and so, I'd already been working, as I said, with my dad for 14 years on his contract grazing program. And so we started contract grazing in 99. And 114 acres have been being grazed. Generally, we'll have between 110 and 145 head of yearling cattle each season. And that, those basically come in the first week in April, leaving the end of, usually to the middle, end of October. A couple years we made it to deer season and could have probably gone longer but uh, too many stray bullets in our part of the country, so we didn't want to chance that. Uh, the remaining 86 acres of the farm is timber. Um, we've been taking soil tests every two years since the mid-80s, and by 1992, the entire farm was up to productive pH and fertility levels, and they've been kept there on a the maintenance program since 92. And today, broom sedge is no longer an issue on our farm. Our mission statement currently is to provide sufficient low stress management and forage for ample growth and development of yearling replacement beef heifers. Uh, the contract grazing we are currently doing is for replacement beef heifers. Uh, they're in the county where we live and uh, about 20 miles from us. We have a real nice arrangement with him and uh, so we're taking care of his replacement heifers for him now in the summer. We started out with steers and uh, he liked the job that we did with those well enough he wanted to chance his heifers to us so that's what we're doing all right the history of the field it's on our maps uh, uh, Rhea Jean's mother uh, came under failing health having to provide 24-7 care for her, which was rather expensive. And it came to the point that we either needed to come up with some dollars some way. And one of the ways to do that was to sell some timber. And so we sold the timber, and if that hadn't been enough to care for her, it was a matter of starting to sell pieces of the farm. And uh, turns out we didn't have to sell pieces of the farm. Uh, we'd have much rather still had Rhea Jean's mother with us, but it didn't work out that way. Then the process of cutting the timber in the winter of 2002, one Friday evening I came home and I asked the timber cutters, I said, would, what would you guys think if I ask you to clear cut an area here in the woods if I marked it off with ribbons this weekend? And they said, well, I said, uh, pulpwood's not, it would cost us some money because pulpwood's not selling very well at this time, but we'd do that. I said, how much are you thinking about? And I said, oh, five or six acres. So I meandered around that weekend with ribbon and tied them around the trees, and sure enough, they came in and clear-cut it, and it was all said and done, and I went down to NRCS and drew it out on the map. It's 14.4 acres, so don't ask me to go into your woods and mark off five acres. It'll be twice that. Uh, but uh, that's what we did, and that's how the clear-cut came about. The only requirement I made of them, I said, uh, don't cut any locust trees. Today, there's one locust tree in that field. That's all they found. So, but uh, it's what we have. And, and uh, the summer of 03, it was uh, timbered the winter of 02 going into 03. Uh, firewood uh, was gleaned from the treetops during that, most of that next summer. There was a family in our area that sells firewood. Uh, they talked to us about if they could get the firewood. And I said, sure. And, uh, so they worked on that through 03, and then uh, we took soil tests in 03. The pH at that time was 4.3 with an 11 ton to the acre lime requirement. 
I said to Rita Jean, I think we made a mistake. I said, I don't know if we can get it to where we want to be in, in our lifetime maybe, but uh, we began to work on it, and the P and K, uh, at that time, were in the medium range on the soil test. After the firewood was taken out, uh, we had a fellow come in with a dozer and wind rode the treetops that were left. Now, remembering that they'd lain there almost a year, and so a lot of those treetops were pretty brittle and dry, and so as he pushed them up with the dozer, a lot of them crumpled and made real nice tight wind rows, made them easier to burn. Uh, at the same time, I indicated to him or told him when he started, I said, don't worry about getting that stuff that's arm size or smaller. Just keep your blade up. I didn't want to lose any topsoil. And I need to say that probably at this time, yeah, take any stumps out. We left all the stumps. I just didn't want to lose the topsoil. That leaf litter was there from however many decades or hundreds of years the timber had been there. I didn't want to lose that. So we left uh, he didn't drop the blade down and scour the ground and uh, wind rode the treetops. Took us five weeks to burn that. Uh, and this was in the springtime, and so I kept calling in the comm center there in the county and said, if anybody calls and says there's a fire burning at Nestor's, yes, there is, but it's under control. Don't worry about it. And after, toward the end of the five weeks, the lady at the comm center said, oh, I can say you must have one hot fire up there. <laughs> she said, you've been calling every morning. But... Uh, it, did, it was a lot of work. Uh, we did put on uh, then the summer of 04, that spring of 04, early. Uh, after we got the trees burned, the tops burned, and that kind of thing, uh, we put on four ton of lime to the acre uh, prior to seeding and 500 pounds of 10 20 20. And we seeded it to straight orchard grass, zero clover. And the reason I did that was because I figured. With all the stumps, there was going to be a lot of sprouts. I may have to go in there and spray to kill those sprouts. And if I did that, I would wipe out any clover that I had seeded. So I didn't put the money in the seed. I just left it and went straight orchard grass. And, uh, and that's the way, that's what we did. Uh, in 05, we also added two tons of the acre of poultry litter. And in 07, when I pulled the soil sample, just after the one application of lime and the litter and, and the 500 pound 10, 20, 20, the pH jumped from where it was at 4.3 to 6.1. And uh, with 1.3 tons to the acre of lime, 91 potassium was at 232. And so I was real pleased with that. And I was completely surprised, but I had to remember Dr. Bill Bryan's uh, presentation. I saw him make one time that uh, when that lime requirement says 11 tons, it may not necessarily take an actual 11 tons to bring that up to where you need it to be. So and that was certainly the case here. In 08, we added another two tons of uh, poultry litter. And in 09, when we sampled again, as I said, we sample every two years now. pH was to 6.8, phosphorus was 65, phosphorus 350. In 11, But in 11, the pH was still 6. I mentioned earlier we didn't apply any clover. Currently, clover is making up about 10 to 15 percent of the stand. Um, just on volunteer, and I guess seed coming in as we bring cattle in. Uh, we did, we've not added any clover seed, but it's it's slowly creeping in, and, and uh, we appreciate that. Basically just let it grow that 04 year, in which that meant the stump sprouts and those kinds of things grew as well. And when we brought the yearling steers, we were still running some steers at that time. Nearly all the stumps sprouted in 05, of course. But the steers seem to seek out and prefer those sprouts. I mean, we put them in there and they would actually go to the stump, to stump, to stump before they even put their nose down the ground to eat the grass. And they came in there that summer, which was about three or four times, those sprouts got nipped off. And
maybe did have some sprouts on it, I sure didn't pass it up. I went ahead and, and hit it with a little bit of crossbow, but um, the steers pretty well took care of the sprouts for us. The blackberries were an issue. Uh, they came back in pretty thick. My dad was in the timber for 45 years. And uh, he always said, if wherever you cut timber, you'll have blackberries. So that's my go to. Uh, any stump sprouts at all. Uh, and there were actually only a few oak, sprout, oak sprout, sprouts after 06, if I can get it out. We had. Uh, and that was the thing I've noticed. You may be wondering, okay, what's the stump situation like now? And uh, currently, a lot of those stumps, are the, the timber that was there had a lot of maple in it, uh, some oak, and uh, some beech here and there, but uh, the maple stumps are pretty well gone at this time. Uh, most of those I can bump with the front end loader on the tractor and upset them. Oak stumps are still gonna be there a while. Uh, we still have those. And I didn't mention it, but when we seeded that, you know, I just hand cranked the orchard grass seed on there. Well, then how do you get it covered? And I actually took the side wall where we'd made a watering trough out of a big tire. Big huge ones, but one of the put around the stumps and let them with the leaf litter. And the only thing Yeah, you caught a stump, but uh, that's how we covered the seed, and I missed saying that a while ago, but uh, we did use garden forefront in uh, 2011, uh, great, a season a year ago. A lot of more the rows. The timber on the edge of that side of the pasture or that field now is completely is completely overgrown with a lot of multiple rows, and it was creeping in in that corner. So I did spray it uh, in, in 11 with that. Uh, and then uh, prior to that, I'd gotten in there with the cutter bar some of the places that the blackberries were worse than I wanted them to be, and I, I called it spot clipped. Uh, during the years of 2004 to 2010, I did that two times. And uh, then in 11, I clipped it all except for the one acre that we sprayed. I clipped it all. I didn't do anything this past season. Never touched it. And uh, we're pretty pleased with where it is. And I have some pictures here in a little bit. You'll see those. Uh, we do have some areas uh, where they made their skid roads through the timber there. That's not very good. We've got some broom sedge cropping up on the edges of those pictures of that. Uh, those have been kind of difficult to get cover on, uh, but we are making progress with that. Uh, and to encourage more uniform grazing, what we did was we located the minerals on one end of the field versus on the opposite end. So we can get the cattle to move back and forth uh, through there. Uh, we usually start grazing the first week in April and ends in late October, depending on the season. Uh, this field, we usually graze it three to five days, depending on, we just watch the grass, and, and uh, we'll have anywhere, we've had as few as 110 and as many as 145 uh, any given year, usually averaging about 120. So, uh, but the way our rotations work on our farm with the 114 acres, each field's getting a 30-day rest at least uh, before they come back, and that's been helpful, I think, as well. Uh, we have been allowing one of the grazing sessions usually to kind of graze it a little closer, kind of clean up some of the stuff, and I think that may be helping a little bit with getting some of that clover to come in there uh, about doing that. So we always try to leave good cover before we go into winter. We don't make that close grazing season the last one. We let that be sometime in the middle of the year when they can have a chance to recover and regrow. Uh, here's what as best I could go back and find our records the other day, uh, what it cost us to do that. Uh, cost us, this is on per acre. 
to get the dozer in there to pile those treetops for us. Uh, $80 an acre for lime. If you remember, we put four, to, four ton of, the, of lime to the acre, and I figured it was $20 a ton. Uh, fertilizer is about 125 a ton, or $125 an acre, I'm sorry. Wish we could get it for 125 a ton. $50 for that initial spraying that I did to clean up those blackberries, $50 an acre there. And uh, it worked out five weeks uh, doing that. So total cost about $470 an acre. Is it worth it? That's something each of us would have to decide. At the time, I said I'd never do that again. Uh, but that land today, it's worth more than 470 an acre, I can tell you that. Uh, certainly it is to us as a pasture field. And, uh, and the other reason we I was in that woods deer hunting or squirrel hunting or whatever, I always wondered why they ever let it grow up. I mean, it laid well enough, I thought, considering our farm. Our farm's pretty steep. And so any place that we can find that's got less slope, we like that. And that was one of them. And so I always wondered why they let it grow up. And so after we cleared it, uh, uh, I like it. <laughs> but, you know, and I'd say currently 800 an acre. Uh, it's uh, for us. But it did allow us to add 14 acres to our forage production. And I started to say there a minute ago, the reason we went ahead and had it cut was because given the situation we were in, we basically told the timber cutters to harvest whatever you can harvest. So they took it down pretty small and we didn't figure we'd ever realize another harvest in our lifetime. So that's why we did that. <coughs> we spent two years to clean uh, The cattle done most of the work. Completely clipped at one time and completely spot sprayed it once with touch-up sprays twice in the eight years since we seeded it. We still have lots of stumps, but many are decaying. The oak stumps, as I said, are, seem to be staying with us. Very many in the shallow soil. Uh, we, are, we, do, we have located another water source in that field now, and uh, we're giving some thought to possibly developing that water source uh, to give us, I'm one that believes you can't get too much water when it comes to trying to manage your pastures and, and work with your cattle. All right, let's, let's take a little picture tour. That's the Laurel, a couple years ago, now you can see from our farm, and that's that's sunrise uh, looking to the east. Looking to the anyway. It is steep, and I was just writing. I'm going to try. I'm going to break up to where we have over 30 days. Not too long ago there at the house. You can see.
steepness of our fields and you know, our fields really should be in squares as far as and that's one reason we've tried to develop water in different places throughout that. We've got a, there's a water source right here that we have a trough that you can't see um, that feeds off of that and there's another trough out here that into this field otherwise it's tough to get to but uh, so with the development of that gas well that helped us here to get better access to that field and we, uh, looking back Uh, bad for a clear cut. And There's that one last <laughs> But um, again, you can see the skid roads. Another shot, same thing.
again, that's, this was all timbered. That's the existing pasture. And then we've made this clear cut into a pasture now and, and put our fences around it. This area is, is similar to this. A lot of multiflora rows growing along this fence line and it had encroached over here to where, again, we decided to spray. Just wintertime shot. About three, four weeks ago. And uh, I mentioned earlier we you can see, again, there's, you know, Plenty of stumps in there, for sure. But you don't see very much bare ground, if any, in that shot either. Uh, this is a little closer view. You can see the grass is getting to where it's starting to cover some of those stumps. I think that helps them decay. In that field, I try to avoid it, because it's probably got a stump on it. Uh, bit of snow uh, over on the other side. But again, several stumps, but pretty good grass cover. And uh, there's a little bit of the broom sedge creeping in there. Some days may be dark and the work hard. Remember, very carefully. Okay, the question was how did I get the lime on? And uh, District has those four time spreaders and worked around through it and went very slow because you sure didn't want to run straddle one of those. The guys were pretty good about cutting the stumps fairly low. I can get over all, well, other than those few that had fence on at one time, I can get over all of them with the tractor. Uh, as far as straddle them, that's not a problem. And, and uh, in fact, the spreader would, would straddle most of those. A lot of them, so. But that's how I did it. I wonder if they cut them down pretty low. I know they deteriorated Yeah, they did cut them. That was one of the things I asked them. I said, if you cut them, cut them as low as you can. And they didn't go as low as they could, but they did cut them lower than they did some of the rest of it. Because they were just cutting a lot of pulp wood and stuff, so it wasn't like they were getting as low as they could to get more dollars out of a high dollar log. That wasn't the case at all. A lot of this stuff was small, so. Other questions? If I was to do this again, what would be the biggest thing I would change? First of all, I'd really assess the cost of what it's going to cost to do it in terms of time and everything. You know, I figured, okay, I'm going, I've burned hundreds of brush piles in my life, but not 14 acres at one time. And that was five weeks of morning and evenings going up there to chunk fires in and, and trying to get everything to burn as best we could. But I'd really look hard at the cost again uh, because at the time, you know, 400 some dollars an acre in it, um, I don't know if it was worth it at that time. Long haul, uh, I'm happy with it. But at that time, if you worked it out dollars and cents, I don't know if it had been worth it or not. Yes? Good points. You know, she made the point that if uh, you know, we didn't put any of the timber dollars back into the development of that clear cut, and that could have helped offset some of those costs. And, and that's true. That's a good point. Yes? Uh, we're doing about the same thing you're doing there. Uh, the uh, state uh, equipment program, mm -hmm. so I actually paid for acres. 
We found that uh, the pile of horse manure on top of the stuff, for some mm -hmm. reason, holds some moisture in and causes the stuff to fall. And I'd say that's probably true because I'm thinking that's kind of what we're doing here with the grass growing up over top of it. We're holding that moisture in there and helping those stumps rot a little quicker. And then we, uh, we in the pasture for, for the cattle, we pasture goats. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, you know, we just, like I say, it was amazing to me when those steers hit that field, they went for those sprouts. I mean, they, they really did. I was surprised at that. Other question? Yes? Why did you leave the locust tree? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I leave a locust tree? Well, A, I thought there would be more than one in the field, <laughs> first of all. And uh, we're always needing, seemingly needing fence posts. And so I did not want the locust trees going to Luke, Maryland for pulpwood. I wanted them leaving for fence posts. I assumed it would have been gone if the fence posts was the reason. Oh, no. I, we, we're fortunate to have a lot of locusts on the farm, and, uh, but that's been something we've always done is, you know, we try not to just ditch those anywhere. We, we try to use them for posts, and we, we do have some posts already stockpiled, but didn't want to. And in fairness to the contractor, they did a pretty good job because they came in there with a, uh, for all I know, it was called a Timco machine where it basically hugged the tree and whacked it off and they could lay the tree down wherever they wanted to. And so they did a pretty good job of kind of pre wind rowing it when they did it. And in fairness to them, I should mention that, and I'm glad you brought it up because they did do that. But then by the time the, the woodcutters came through and got their firewood, Things were kind of in disarray by the time they dragged stuff out and that kind of thing. So, but yeah, good point. Others? What kind of expense did you have on your machinery on all that? Expense on the machinery in terms of, uh, I don't know, Don. We had uh, it took me basically a day to crank the seat on and, and drag it with four wheeler, so I had that cost. Uh, then when I spread the four ton of the acre of lime, which you know, whatever that is or was at the time. And, uh, and then the only other costs I had was two times of clipping it, spot clipping it one time completely and sprayed it, that one acre. What I'm referring to is bringing your machinery down. <laughs> oh, you mean tearing something up? Yeah. Okay, Don's wanting to know how much equipment I tore up. Uh, so far, none, believe it or not. Uh, like I said, we tried to go slow and, and uh, the, when I was in there with the cutter bar, it's a New Holland 456, I think it is, and it's got that nice little safety breakaway on it. I kept it well greased. <laughs> because one of those stumps, it kicked back. So, And I was trying to watch for them as well. And I wasn't trying to, like other than one time, I didn't try to completely clip it. I was just hitting the places where there were blackberries. But. But yeah, no, I didn't tear anything up, believe it or not. Others? The grazing program, how soon did you turn the cattle in and how often the first few years did the cattle get exposed? To the okay, uh, question was in terms of the grazing, how, when did we first turn them in and, and then how often after that? Uh, we seeded it the spring of 04, the cattle never saw that field that summer. We let it grow all summer. so the, the First year after seeding, they didn't touch it. Spring of 05 was their first exposure. So it had a year to grow. And, and so they went in there, um, let's see, the cattle would have come in the first week of April, say, and that field would be the last field in our rotation. So given that there's 12 paddocks and there's, normally our paddocks will hold them three to four days, two to three on some of them. If you figure an average of three, it was first of May before they ever saw it in 05. And the grass was getting pretty tall at that point. So that was the first time they, they were in it. And then subsequent to that, they're in there about every 30 days uh, through the grazing season. We don't skip it any time. It, they go, it's in the rotation. 
So every 30 days, thereabouts, they're in that field. Yes, somebody else? Yes, over here. The chemicals you put on to kill certain plants, were those harmful? The question was, was the chemicals we use to kill certain plants, will they hurt honeybees? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Because uh, we used uh, crossbow, so it wasn't an insecticide, it was a, an herbicide. And we used, uh, in 11, we used some forefront. And so we're killing brush and weeds, so I don't know that honeybees would be impacted or not, uh, since it was not an insecticide, I don't know. I don't remember seeing anything on the label to that effect, but I don't know, to be honest with you. Others? Yes. The question was, did I think orchard grass was the best cover to put on that? And obviously, I uh, feel like you're fishing. You want to know why I didn't use fescue. But, uh, but at any rate, uh, we went with orchard grass because uh, I knew that we were not going to be in a situation with that field. Honestly, I didn't want to introduce more fescue than what we already have. Uh, we do have a fair amount of fescue in the rest of the farm in some different places. And honestly, today, there's a fair amount of fescue already made its way into that clear cut. And so I didn't do that. Uh, that would have been a quick way to get a quick cover. I kind of rolled the marbles a little bit from the standpoint I felt I had enough leaf litter and topsoil still there that I could get a good stand of orchard grass. And so that's what we went with. Um, and, and I didn't want to pay the dollars to go to an endophyte free fescue. So, yes, Don? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Same way I did with the lime. Uh, in fact, you used the same. Uh, and uh, the question was, was you know, we put two applications of poultry litter on, and I was doing that. One, I wanted the organic matter, and two, I knew I'd get the boost in the fertility. And uh, so that's why we used it, and the dollars were right on it when we got it. And, but it was, I mean, it was one of the things just the same as putting the lime on. We had to be very careful fishing our way around through the stumps. Uh, and it took a lot longer, I mean, uh, because, because of the stumps. I mean, it, it took us extra time to be able to do that. But that's what we did. Used the same spreader that we did with the lime. And didn't worry about if we got it on a little bit heavier in one place or another. I figured it's a clear cut. Uh, we're trying to get some organic matter and some fertility and, and from the soil test uh, we've managed to do that with what we've done and we're pretty pleased with that. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, one back here. You say you're about 120 head. Now, you keep them all in one group or did you split them up and rotate them and like, you know, 40 head in three different groups? Okay. The question is we run generally around 120 head, do we keep them in one group or do we split them up into three or four and, and move them around within the farm? Uh, since we started keeping replacement heifers, it works a little bit, well, it works like this. Uh, we do the AI work around the 10th of May and the day we do the, the AI work, the 100, we'll say 120, is split in half. One group goes to one part of the farm and the other group goes to the other part. So there's two groups at that point. Then after we do the AI work, the bulls are brought in, one bull for each group the next week, usually Monday or Tuesday after we do finish up on Saturday. And then those stay for 45 days. And at that point, then they're all brought back to one group together to run one, the 120 will stay together the rest of the season. They're together till we bring, till we do the AI and the bull work. They're, that, that's the only days that they're separate, which makes it a little more challenging for us to keep the rotation and keep the bulls and heifers in two different. The beauty is fields on the opposite side of the hill, and some down around our house. We're able to do that, and we work the rotation to where they're never 
side by side at the fences. Uh, we, and that's taken us a little while to figure that out. And that keeps us apart. And, and about being early in the season, you know, we're able to run, actually we're running a heavier, you know, they're coming back quicker than 30 days during those days that early in the season. So that, I don't know, I'll as much stuff off on trying to keep the tops down here when we're doing it. Here. Since it's replacement heifers, we just agreed on a figure. That's what we did. We, we kind of used our rate of gain that we had with the steers. We kind of used that as a basis and then agreed on a number if we were to do the heifers and the service to provide with that. So that's just a lump sum. Okay? To give you a little more history on the farm, uh, pasture walks and so forth, and I, I can remember before he ever cut that uh, woodland, back then he only run, what, 90 head of cattle then? Well, when we, they're not, I got everything turned off here now. In 98, uh, when we had the cows, we were running about 40 cows and calves, cow calf pair. That's what we were running. But anyway, when he started running yearlings, he went from 90 to 140. So that left acres put a pretty big jump in his uh, herd that he could pass in that. 